and trying to engage different ideas. And, and what's so good about tonight is the fact that we do have um, a very sort of diverse uh, panel of speakers. So it should make for a great discussion. Pauline, Pauline, without further ado, it's over to you to give us your take on the question. Is the union cracking up? And is it a good thing if it is cracking up, yes or no? Over to you, Pauline. Thanks very much, Kevin. I'm going to start with, with Brexit. Uh, the most compelling argument for Brexit turned on the principle that decisions about the UK should be taken in the UK. In other words, the democratic principle that citizens be fully empowered to exercise control over political decision making and to hold elected politicians to account. And for radical Democrats, political power is not simply the power to change governments, important as that is, but the power to change the way we are governed. And this same yearning for democratic renewal, I believe fuels popular campaigns for Scottish independence and Irish reunification. But like Brexit, yearning isn't good enough to deliver the promised outcome of popular democratic control. Now, as someone who campaigned for Britain to leave the EU, um, I think I believe it's important to adopt a more inquiring engagement with calls for popular sovereignty inside the United Kingdom and a more rigorous engagement with the shortcomings of uh, the union. The result, uh, sorry, the refusal to confront the shortfall of democracy in the United Kingdom has dogged the process of Britain's withdrawal from the EU. And no more so than in the intractable arguments around the border in Northern Ireland. And to avoid a hard border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, Northern Ireland has been separated from the internal UK market. And apart from creating logistical problems, the Northern Ireland Protocol removes democratic control over economic decision-making in Northern Ireland from the people who live there and from their fellow UK citizens. So for Democrats, this leaves only two options, assert the integrity of the United Kingdom or support the reunification of Ireland. And I'm proposing that Democrats in Britain support the latter by calling on the British government to signal its intention to begin an orderly withdrawal from Northern Ireland. And uh, I wanna put forward three reasons why I think this, is, this option is necessary. Firstly, defending the integrity of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland has consistently worked against the democratic rights and freedoms of people in Britain, Ireland and Northern Ireland. And for 50 years after partition, the devolved government of Northern Ireland was able to grant itself coercive powers uh, more in common with a colonial administration than a modern democratic state. And when the Northern Ireland state collapsed in 1972, direct rules saw the transfer of the Stormont government's legislative and executive powers back to Westminster, including highly exceptional emergency powers, such as the power to intern citizens without trial. And with every renewal and extension of the PTA, the Prevention of Terrorism Act, and every adjustment to liberal freedoms and protections, the abrogation of rights and freedoms in Britain and Northern Ireland became normalized as the anti-democratic exception was established as the rule. Secondly, Britain has never sought to integrate Northern Ireland into the union. In March, 1972, weeks before implementing direct rule, the British cabinet clarified the relationship between the crisis of democracy in Northern Ireland and the contradictions inherent in, and I quote, its artificially constructed constitution. And on their reading, this is the cabinet papers from 72, March 72, Northern Ireland's exceptional history of political instability and civil conflict set it apart from the rest of the United Kingdom, the rest of Britain. And rather than confront the limitations on British sovereignty in Ireland, however, the cabinet proposed a facilitating role for Britain, standing back as an honest broker. Now, um, you know, working with the community to democratize and rebuild the state, that's how they put it. And the policy of bipartisanship in the Westminster Parliament insulated successive British governments from democratic scrutiny 
In spite of widespread public disquiet, the vast expenditure of political, human and economic resources and repeated failure. And finally, number three, my third reason is that history shows that administrative solutions have never resolved the contradictions of British sovereignty in Ireland. And after repeated failures, yet another ingenious solution was devised to fill the political void, and that is the Good Friday Agreement, which promised to settle Britain and Ireland's dispute over sovereignty by granting all the people of Northern Ireland the authority to determine their own future. However, the identity of the political community with the authority to determine that future through peaceful democratic means remains very far from clear. And this is where I part company with the argument that Irish reunification is only a matter of time, not because British sovereignty is all powerful, but rather because the ambiguous and muddled nature of British sovereignty in Northern Ireland drives a tendency towards conflict and inertia. And these tendencies will be reinforced as the contradictions in the Northern Ireland Protocol play out, further entrenching communal resentments and political stasis. And where the decision to trigger a border poll remains in the gift of the British Secretary of State under diplomatic pressure from Dublin, Washington and Brussels, I believe that Irish people will have to confront an even greater obstacle to Irish reunification. And that is the threat that it poses to all those interests that wield power in Ireland. So finally, the only force I believe that can break the dismal cycle of conflict, instability and inertia will have to emerge from citizens in Belfast, Dublin, Liverpool, Glasgow, Cardiff and London, mobilizing around a determination to exercise greater scrutiny and control over the political decisions that affect their lives at home. It's, it's really that easy and that simple, but it's also that difficult. I'll finish there. Brilliant, Polly. Thank you very much. And uh, without further ado, Brian, straight on to yourself whenever you're ready. Great. Thank you, Kevin. Um, well, I'd like to address, first of all, the idea um, or the question if it's uh, cracking up. It seems to me that it's appeared like it has been cracking up for a very long time, but it never quite breaks down altogether. Um, if I look at it from the Scottish perspective, we've had a referendum in 2014, which certainly by the Brexit referendum gave an emphatic answer. Uh, slightly over uh, 50, 55 to slightly under 45. Um, and that was, that was in uh, a setup where the referendum as it was conceived uh, was essentially everything that the Scottish National Party, uh, Scottish government at the time asked for. It had the franchise, uh, not just the age of people who could vote, but where they actually resided. I had, for instance, two sons born in Scotland, raised in Scotland, Scottish parents, both at Scottish schools, both at Scottish universities. One decided to go to work in Glasgow. One, as is his right, uh, decided to go to work in London. Uh, given he was an economist, he ended up working in a bank. And yet, although they were twins and although they had that similar background, uh, only one had a vote. Uh, so, so this referendum that was, it took place in 2014, it was at the timing, at the franchise, um, and the question. And yet, uh, here we are still arguing now, all these years later, about whether or not we should have a further referendum because those that lost believed that reasons uh, changed uh, and that there should be the ability to have a, another deci decision. So that 
feeds into the concept, I think, that, um, that, that the union is cracking up because irrespective of the other aspects uh, elsewhere in the union, there is a great deal of pressure uh, for another referendum. And there, there is a feeling that it might have a different outcome this time because the SNP uh, have since won a further uh, uh, general election, they've won further uh, Holyrood election uh, and seem to go from strength to strength. And indeed we have the polls that for 23 consecutive polls at least uh, suggested that uh, independence uh, or uh, secession might in fact happen. But we've just recently seen in the last six polls uh, that it's returned now to uh, Scotland would consider staying uh, in the union. My, my, my view about the polls is that what matters is not the individual poll, but the trends, and the trends uh, showed an ebb and flow, but they did not reflect what many commentators thought would happen, which was that when uh, we voted as a UK to, uh, for Brexit, that Scotland would take the half. In fact, the polls generally stayed more or less the same as they had, and it wasn't really until um, till Boris Johnson became prime minister that the polls began to move. Not Brexit itself, but the change in prime minister. Now, of course, prime ministers come and go. Uh, they're for Christmas, not forever. And some might be relieved about that. Uh, we can see there might be other institutional changes that could affect people's views about whether or not the union should survive. Possibly, for instance, changes in the makeup of the monarch. Uh, that might be an influence that we cannot foresee at the moment, how that might change when the monarch change, changes or changes again after that. So for me, nothing is certain about the union. Uh, we can see that there are results in elections, the results in, in referenda and results in polling, but very quickly within a number of years, the, 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 the norms and the expectations can actually be quite different from what we thought they would be. And therefore, I, I think that uh, what we're about to see at the moment is probably, for instance, uh, an SNP uh, win uh, in as much as they undoubtedly, I expect them to uh, be the largest party, and they may uh, have enough uh, support from the Greens, who are, seem to be the only Green Party in the whole world that actually puts independence or nationalism before uh, environmentalism. Uh, those two parties together, I think, will probably form the administration, and so the tensions uh, will continue. But I don't think that anything is certain. And the reason for that is because the attitude of the unionists, if I may broadly call them that, uh, has actually changed over the years, uh, most recently. And this may have some relationship to do with uh, uh, Brexit uh, that we've had. And that is that the age of appeasement towards nationalists, I think, is coming to an end. I think we can see that in the policy of Gove and Johnson and the Scottish Secretary, Alastair Jack. I think what we are going to see is a far more winning of hearts and minds and a lot more emphasis on hearts than there has been before uh, to try and actually ensure people want to stay in the union and not just grudgingly accept it. Um, if I may just uh, describe what happened in the, in, in the referendum uh, briefly to say that that decision was hugely influenced by the project fear issues of currency, pensions, uh, finances. And that was because Better Together, who ran the uh, campaign to stay in the, in, in the UK, were polling regularly and found that those were the issues that mattered most to the swing voters. But what we never had was a positive pitch from Better Together uh, why the union should survive. I think that over the coming years, we will see far more emphasis on the hearts uh, rather than the, the, the minds uh, and trying to convince people that there's something for being in Britain. The pooling and sharing, 
the solidarity, the community and family spirit. Those I think are going to have much more influence, uh, but by no means certain to win, but I do think that that will make a difference to the argument and that nobody can foretell, uh, I certainly can't, what will uh, emerge. I couldn't have foretold uh, COVID, I couldn't have foretold after a bad pandemic management that the, the success, uh, successful management of the vaccine would actually present an argument to show there is something for Britain after all. So I actually am an optimist. I believe Britain will survive. I've looked primarily, obviously, at the Scottish context. I'm sure that's why I've been invited, uh, although I, I will contribute to discussions about Ireland and Northern Ireland as well. Um, but for me, I don't see any big changes. I think there will always be tensions. Uh, but the, in the, uh, for the moment, uh, the unionists, whilst they look like they might be using, are uh, certainly not uh, uh, losing the war. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Uh, I absolutely love that. So thank you very much, Brian. Great. Lots to get stuck into. And uh, last, but absolutely no means by least, Kevin, give us your take. Just remember to unmute, first of all. Um, thanks, Kevin. Thanks, everybody. Um, I'll try and rattle through this. Um, disunited Kingdom, is the UK cracking up? Um, my first thought was, do we mean constitutionally or emotionally? Um, and perhaps, in fact, it's both. Um, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland has been a hardy construct, but it is in worsening shape as it approaches its 200th birthday. Um, by then, uh, both Scotland and Northern Ireland may be leaving or have left. In six weeks time, we find out in the Scottish parliamentary elections whether or not the SNP has managed to assemble a majority um, that would turbo boost their demands for a second independence referendum. A year after that, um, something similar may ha well happen in Northern Ireland with the Northern Irish uh, Assembly election. Um, Sinn Féin may emerge as the largest party. Um, there may be a majority um, of parties that are committed to holding a border poll, um, a stay or go referendum that is promised, um, of course, in the Good Friday Agreement, if there is demonstrable demand, uh, dem demonstrable demand for one, of which, of course, there may well be. Um, incidentally, the, um, the provisions of the Good Friday Agreement allow for a, a referendum, a poll, a border poll to be held every seven years. Uh, a point which has not been lost on uh, Scottish campaigners who point out, of course, that it's seven years um, since the uh, 2014 uh, referendum as well, Indy Ref 1. Um, could the British government cope with the post-Brexit fallout, midterm blues, um, atrophied public finances following the pandemic and two constitutional crises, which may be, may be coming? Um, the UK as a concept is being stress tested. It has been before. I think, as Brian pointed out, um, a creaking gate can last a very long time. Um, most notably, of course, the departure of most of the rest of Ireland a century ago. But these latest pressures um, feel to me um, much less dramatic, more predictable, slow burning and gathering sustained momentum. Um, what has caused this? Um, first and foremost, I think the failure, um, particularly looking at Scotland, the failure of the devolution model to stick. Um, the appetite for local control has grown, um, taking back control uh, to coin a phrase. I think there's something that's energizing um, and exhilarating about being at the birth of a nation. And I think we saw that in the first Scottish um, referendum um, campaign where uh, broadly support for independence grew from the kind of high 20s to 45% over the course of the campaign, week by week. Um, it seemed to get stronger and stronger despite, despite the best endeavours of the Westminster and, and business and media elites in this country trying to convince um, Scottish voters obviously not to, not to jump. Um, it feels a little bit to me that that's not, that support has never really dropped back below 45%, I think I'm correct in saying, and, and seems to be in a, in a very sort of sustainable place to, 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 to go one stage further. So I think the failure of the devolution model is, is, is hugely important. I think there's been a disinterest and I would say even disregard for devolution in Westminster. I was once told by, I'm not naming, but once told by a former colleague of mine who was a ministerial special advisor to one of the, um, 
one of the Labour first ministers that Tony Blair regarded it as an annual chore um, to phone up and speak to his boss. Um, Labour Scotland's failure, I would say, to take devolution seriously includes fielding a B team in Scotland for very many years. Uh, the talent continue to head to Westminster. Um, and if I can put it like this, um, Anna Sawar, who um, has taken over as the, the latest uh, leader of the Scottish Labour Party, um, there have been 19 leaders of the Scottish Labour Party since 1999. There have been nine, nine full-timers uh, and there have been 10 interims. And in fact, Anna Sawar is not only a former deputy leader of the Scottish Labour Party, he's also a former interim leader of the Labour Party in Scotland as well. Um, I think there's also an issue with people having long memories of conservative uh, rule in Scotland as well. Um, obviously, the, the creation of the Scottish Parliament itself and the devolution process was opposed by the Conservatives, who, of course, tested at the poll tax in Scotland before they introduced it in England. But I think, I think one of, the, one of the, these, these kind of centrifugal forces is that ultimately the United Kingdom is not a marriage of equals. We're looking at 64, 65 million people in the UK, 55 million live in England, 5 million in Scotland, 3 in Wales and just 1.8 in Northern Ireland. The English call the tune and English nationalism, um, which seems to have, have, have coalesced um, around the Brexit vote, um, is a fairly elemental political force um, pulling um, Scottish and Northern Irish voters out to the EU against their wills, um, which has obviously um, led to um, significant support for um, independence in Scotland and Irish unity as well. And, uh, you know, I think the, the interesting thing for me as somebody that writes quite a lot on, on Northern Irish affairs is the kinds of people who are supporting uh, Irish unity now stretch way beyond the kind of usual suspects um, amongst Irish Republicans and old-fashioned Irish patriots. Um, a lot of young people, particularly, who would never have voted for Sinn Féin, would happily vote for a border poll if there's one held tomorrow. So the English call the tune. Um, that's, that's, a, that's a political um, development which we're still, I think, trying to get to grips with. But I think one of the interesting factors for me was um, in repeated polls of English voters, uh, whether they wanted to preserve the union or they wanted Brexit, if it was going to cause problems for the union, they wanted Brexit every single time. I think more prosaically, there's been frustration with the over-centralisation of the UK state, um, our politics and our, econ and our economy have been too London-centric, too southeast England, too Southern English uh, focused for far too long. Um, and interestingly, of course, there was a recent poll um, of Welsh voters that had 39% of them backing independence as well. So, so we've got... We've got Scotland, we've got Northern Ireland, we've got Wales unhappy as well, and we've got Northern England um, fairly unhappy over a long period of time as well. So much so that where I live here in Sheffield, um, all of the local authorities uh, in the Yorkshire area um, basically want uh, maximum economic devolution from London um, as, as, as an ongoing deal. Um, there's also a, North, North, a Northern Independence Party that started. That's before we even start looking at things like Cork. Uh, Cornish separatism as well. So there's a lot of centrifugal forces at play. Um, does saving the UK matter? It just occurred to me that, that that's a fairly seminal question. Um, it does and it doesn't. It's not the end of the world if there is Irish unity. It's not the end of the world if there is an independent Scotland. Um, I think Irish unity, the departure of Northern Ireland, is baked into Westminster's assumptions. And I think, frankly, there will be audible sighs of relief um, when it is gone. I think the government is principally focused on saving Scotland. And I think uh, the 2014 result, the 2014 referendum result is very poorly understood in Westminster. We, there was a kind of, we've got through it, we've managed to win, um, great, let's move on. And, and I don't think there's been anything like enough concentration on repairing the damage that's been done for a very long time um, north of the border. Uh, Boris Johnson's solution is a new union unit um, in Downing Street. Um, there's some sensible suggestions that have come out of uh, this agenda so far, uh, moving some of the BBC, civil servants further north, um, trying to show that we need to we need to balance out um, um, opportunity around around the UK and the nations and regions. Uh, I think that's valuable. Um, there have been some crackers ideas, including of course the road bridge and then even a tunnel uh, between Scotland and Northern Ireland. And just this week, we've seen moves to um, fly the Union flag on all public buildings every day, which may seem fairly innocuous in England, but will cause huge problems in Northern Ireland and potentially violence there as well as an issue. Um, my conclusion is the union is a union cracking up. 
yes and no. I think Northern Ireland, as I say, is parked in an antechamber um, from the time of the Good Friday Agreement. It's governed by the principle of consent. When a majority of people there want to leave, the British government will facilitate it. So the effort is around Scotland. And the, the issue is whether or not um, Scottish nationalism can be put back in a box um, in the next six weeks or whether it wins a majority in the Scottish Parliament. And if it does, then I suspect that events will um, spiral out of Westminster's control very, very quickly. And I'll just pause there. Kevin, thanks very much. Um, um, to our listeners, can I say, um, get stuck and get your hands up. I'm going to ask each speaker a wee question. It won't take long for them to respond, and then we'll go out to the audience. Um, in no particular order, I don't care who picks up um, first, but I've got some to ask each of you. Kevin, if I, st if I start the question with you, I'll, I'll repeat the questions to the other two people and then choose who wants to come in first and second and third. Um, there's two things that occur to me. First of all is this, this thing about you saying the United Ireland is inevitable. And I noticed Pauline picked up on that. Um, is, there, is there a chance that you've been a bit arrogant there, a bit complacent? And even when you do your speech, you talk about the sky elections in a few weeks and the Northern Ireland Assembly elections next week. It's a big if that parties in, will be elected to the Northern Ireland Assembly who will have a majority in terms of um, opting for a border poll, question mark. But the second question, do you can squeeze it in, Kevin, is if, let's just cut to the chase. You're incredibly intelligent guy can you give me two or three sentences about why you want the united ireland why above all what does it boil down to what's the driving force of a united ireland to get you out of bed in the morning and brian the question to you again really good analysis i enjoyed it why do you want to be part of the union brian is it a heart question for you or is it a mind question for you i i'm curious about the whole reasons why you would want to be part of something or to break away. And also, Brian, if you want to squeeze in a few seconds, you don't have to now, but give us your very quick thoughts on the Northern Ireland question as well, if you wish. And then Pauline, for you, um, I, I'm interested, what is your view on Scotland? Don't spend too long, but yes, do you support their desire for a referendum and do you support Scottish independence? Yes or no? And then finally, Paul, if you squeeze in something else for you, Brexit supporters, do you think it's hypocritical of a Brexit supporter if they don't support a border poll in the north of Ireland? Or do you think, no, it's not. I might support the United Ireland, but somebody who voted Brexit is going to be right to, to insist that Northern Ireland stays part of the union. Or is that a contradiction? Question mark. And I want you to answer them very quickly. So I'm, I'm asking a lot because then I want to go straight out to the audience. Who would like to come in first? Everybody's quiet. Kevin, I'm looking at you. Your, oh. your, your handsome face is on the screen. So why don't you go first? Which I go first? I, um, I'm being um, arrogant in predicting um, uh, Irish unity is inevitable. Uh, it's a fair enough question. Um, I just look at the range of factors um, and I just I can just see a constellation where, where it just drives us to this point. And I, I made this argument um, five years ago when I wrote my book um, just just as Brexit was happening. And like everybody else, I never thought Brexit actually would happen. And then it just struck me that Brexit is is, is a, you know, is, is an accelerant that's poured over the dry tinder of lots of other issues which are already in train in Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland is based Northern Ireland's existence is predicated on the principle of consent enshrined in the Good Friday Agreement in 1998, which is the, a weather vane. Um, at the moment, it means that there are a majority of people who wish to remain part of the United Kingdom and their identity and their wish should be upheld. If it looks as though um, that is likely to change and that there is growing support for Irish unity, that can be tested in a border poll, as it's colloquially known, a constitutional referendum. Um, at which point, if there is a majority um, for joining the rest of Ireland, then the British government and the Irish government will facilitate that. Ireland would have a, a parallel referendum on that point as well. So, th so that's clear. There's, there is nowhere else in no other context where the British state is so sanguine about sovereignty. I think that, that's, that's important to say. So, so there, there are a range of factors. We can look at the electoral results in Northern Ireland, which are, which are, which are changing unionism if you combine all the unionist parties is in a minority of course northern ireland was created 100 years ago to lock in a unionist ascendancy 
um, and, and you know, over the years that position has eroded um, and we're likely to see in the census that's taking place at the moment later in the year, um, a, a majority um, for either Catholics or certainly a minority of people who are Protestants. In and of itself, that doesn't matter. I mean, it's just a head count. It doesn't matter, but it's deeply symbolic because, of course, that was how Northern Ireland was established. It was established on that basis to lock in that support. Now, I think, I think the, the, the top and bottom of it is with Northern Ireland is it wasn't meant to last this long. It wasn't built to last. Um, I think, as Pauline rightly pointed out, between 1921 and 1972, the place was run as a sectarian fief. It was a disgrace, quite frankly. Um, which which triggered the troubles and then 30 years of the troubles and then 20 years of stop start political progress. So it's been a 50, 30, 20 um, century um, for Northern Ireland. But it just strikes me that I think they say in chess that um, when you're um, playing a losing game that you're in zugzwang, I think I think the, the, the term is that every move you make, it, it's not the end of the game, you're not in checkmate, but every move you make will make your position weaker. And I suspect that's where unionists in Northern Ireland now are. And I suspect many of them realise that and that they're just trying to hold on for as long as possible. Now, I mean, really, we need to have an intelligent conversation about how things move forward. And that's true um, in Scotland as well. We need to have, we need to have a, a situation where it is not the worst thing in the world if it's United Ireland or an independent Scotland. There are, there are merits and demerits depending on your point of view. And I think we need to sort of flesh these out more. And this is why tonight is, is, you know, is, is so interesting. But for me, Ireland is about Brexit, making the place um, a great deal more difficult. Um, we're going to see, for example, if I can very briefly just, just you know, sort, sort of say this. Um, very, very quickly, Kevin. Yes, no, no, no. Northern Ireland's got fundamental economic difficulties, economic problems. Brexit will make them all worse. The demographics of the place are changing. The electoral profile of the place is changing. Support in opinion polls for, for Irish unity is growing. Um, and Britain is fundamentally disinterested in keeping the place. I think, I think that's the nub of it. Brilliant. Love it. Brad, on to you. Can you hear me, Brian? Yeah, I can hear you. I was just unmuting. Um, well, the first rule I, I try to apply to uh, politics is that there's no such thing as inevitability in politics. Uh, I, I've been around too long to believe things would happen and see that they've not. Uh, I've taken, taken part in debates such as the debate about how inevitable the euro would be for Britain uh, to see that it didn't happen, uh, to be relieved that it didn't happen. Um, uh, I don't believe Scottish independence is in, uh, inevitable, and I certainly don't believe that uh, Irish unification is inevitable. Um, to answer the point that you put to me, uh, I am a heart over head uh, advocate. I believe uh, I, I'm, in Brit I'm British uh, with a strong Scottish, Scottish streak. Um, I love nothing better uh, to see uh, my uh, Scottish team uh, beat the other home nations, uh, but obviously most uh, most of all England, for the simple reason they're the, the, the biggest, uh, the hardest, and most difficult uh, challenge. Um, but it's competition. It's nothing other than that. Um, I see myself as being part of a family, a family that uh, I, I was raised in, born in the late fifties, raised in the sixties. I'm pleased to be able to think as I as I did uh, that, that the Beatles were mine. Uh, you know, I know, I know we had a drummer from Edinburgh uh, who played with them. Um, but to me, the Beatles were part of me. The Rolling Stones were part of me. Uh, Mary Hopkins from Wales, part of me. To me, British is a family. Uh, and, and, and that's how I feel about it. Now, I know not everybody will hold those views. And those, those views may be decreasing, uh, partly because some politicians try very hard to make sure they do. Um, but I think the ebb and flow, and there's no knowing where that's going. It can change and change quite dramatically. Um, so, so much as why I think, and I could put later some of the financial reasons why I think it would be a mistake for Scotland. My reason is to argue about the benefits uh, uh, of being in uh, Britain for Scots. To move on quickly for you, uh, I think something that knits neatly is the idea that Scotland can be separate. So, uh, you know, it's possible. It could make a fist of it. But there's nothing uh, to me that works in a sense of saying Ireland should be together because it's an island. Well, if you believe Ireland should be together because it's an island and, and Irish should be together, then why should Scotland uh, uh, be separate? We are in one island. 
uh, and, and, and the converse is true as well. If you believe that, uh, that Scotland should be able to leave and be separate, then Northern Ireland should be able to decide to stay in the United Kingdom. Um, so, so there's this incongru incongruity about the idea of inevitability uh, because we're all on an island uh, or a number of islands. Uh, or is it something deeper? Is it something that actually, is it, is it racial? That we're Irish or we're, we're Scottish and not, not English? Um, I think that's a dangerous path myself. Um, so is it a democratic issue? Um, I think, again, there's some financial issues that I, I don't want to take up more time, but there's some financial issues where Ireland has problems that people might not want to join Ireland from Northern Ireland. And I might touch on those later, uh, but I don't want to take up all this time. That's brilliant. Absolutely great. I, I enjoyed that very much. Um, brilliant. Pauline, on to yourself and then we'll get out to the audience. Okay, um, I'll answer that. Yeah, the first question you asked, is it, is it a critical of people who supported um, Brexit not to support Irish reunification? And I, I wouldn't use the word, no, I wouldn't say hypocritical, but I do think it's actually a misreading of, um, of, of the idea of sovereignty and why it matters. And I think that um, uh, what I was trying to say really was that, uh, that, uh, that, you know, the problem really is that Britain cannot assert authority in Northern Ireland. It, it historically has been able, unable to do it. And uh, because it cannot assert authority or sovereignty in Northern Ireland, then it acts as a, as a kind of drag or a ball and chain on um, sovereignty in Britain. So it has a... Um, it, 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 the, the protocol which I talked about, you know, the Northern Ireland Protocol is, is just another example, a, another sort of progeny of this mess and contradiction of British, um, the British rule in Northern Ireland. It's just the, the latest in a long line. It's the worst of all worlds because under the protocol, the people of Northern Ireland have no say over, no economic sovereignty, none. They cannot actually make a decision on, they can't vote for politicians who can make economic decisions, not in their gift, but neither can their fellow citizens in the United Kingdom. And that's just clearly wrong because people, you know, no representation, no taxation without representation and very basic. Um, it's basically anti-democratic and it's wrong. So there has to be a, there has to be a solution to that. And um, I think though that, no, I, 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 I think that really people who support, um, who want greater control over um, their government in Britain and want to bring um, you know, exercise citizens to exercise control and scrutiny over the British government. Well, that is just not compatible, I don't think, with Britain's kind of semi detached sovereignty in Northern Ireland. It just does, it hasn't worked historically. I don't think it will. On the question of whether I support independence for Scotland, you said yes or no. And the answer is no, I don't. Um, partly for what Brian said, I know when the referendum was on, I had one of, I, I was a bit like him. I had a, a heart and head moment, and my heart told me. I didn't want it. I'm from the northeast of England and we were very close to we had lots of contacts with Scotland and I felt it very strongly. However, I would also make the point, I think, on a sort of, um, you know, the politics of this is that actually, for all the reasons I said that Northern Ireland should have independence and be reunified, sorry, re, not independence, reunification with Ireland, none of those apply to Scotland. Scotland was not in a coercive um, relationship with Britain. It was a union of equals. Okay, the, 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 the demography might be different, but the union between um, Britain and Scotland is a very different character to the uh, United Kingdom relationship, you know, to Northern Ireland. And also Britain and Scotland, you know, England and Scotland are integrated. They, they, it's not like, it's not semi-detached like Northern Ireland. So for all those reasons, I think that um, it's, it is much better that we keep that together. I think that actually a lot of the things driving um, Scottish um, independence are not, some of them are, I think are positive. I've heard some great arguments for, and I've heard, and, I, and that's why I think it's important to, to engage constructively with other people's demands, because they're all demands in a, essentially for greater control and for democratic control. And I think that has to be respected. But I also see that there is a, a kind of giving up 
element in this that, you know, well, we're never going to be able to change anything. We can't do anything about it. So we'll just get off, you know, stop the world. I want to get off. And it's a kind of impulse really just to kind of disengage from politics. And I think that's mistaken. I think it's wrong to break up um, a, 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 when you have a, a very big com political community that could together bring about change. Um, I think it's wrong to break it up into little bits and fragment it. And um, I think devolution is the worst of all worlds because it's government without responsibility. But I don't think it's going to be solved. I'm not quite sure what the SNP is talking about anyway in terms of independence, whether it's just a sort of more, you know, a more pronounced form of devolution or of its real independence. It's not clear. I'm, a, I'm not for either of those. No, I am for um, uh, England uh, people, people, citizens in England, Scotland and Wales. Um, staying together and working together to to build a better society and a more democratic society. I think we'll, we all face the same question. Same point. Right, Pauline, dead on. Look, listeners, I want to encourage you, get your hands up, get stuck into the debate. Guess what? This is a tricky debate. It can be convoluted because we're trying to talk about the union. What is the union? Is it cracking up or not cracking up? Question mark. But you're also trying to look at the issue of Scotland and also the north of Ireland. And they can be separate things, but they're also overlapping things. Is there any energy in any of them? Is there any sense of dynamic that sort of excites you in terms of moving politics in a more democratic direction? Question mark. I want to hear from you. No such thing as a stupid question. Please think out loud. Give our speakers a hard time or at least engage with them. Um, Simon Belt, I see your hand. We'll take you first um, whenever you're ready, Simon. Uh, and after Simon, we're going to go for Ella Whelan. Simon, on you go. Uh, thanks, Kevin. And it certainly is a, a tricky issue. Um, the lockdown, one of the pastimes of a lot of people is to get involved in jigsaws. So to use a, a lockdown analogy, there does seem to be a missing piece uh, in the jigsaw that uh, the speakers have kind of avoided. I think uh, Kevin uh, has introduced Brexit to his credit, um, not really spelt it out. And I think the issue of the EU is the tricky, the, the most trickiest one for me. Um, so. Kevin, you make a point about Brexit being uh, taking back control and the English um, calling the tune uh, for uh, control over Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland. I wonder which English you're talking about because most English people are not calling the tune over Scotland, Wales or Ireland. Um, so, uh, and really more to the point, which is what Pauline was kind of finishing up on, um, politicians don't seem to be calling the tune. And there does seem to be uh, an abdication of responsibility by a lot of politicians. So the issue of the EU, I think, is really important for me because the, the whole notion of um, independence in the EU or independence from the uh, from the UK um, but within the EU calls into question that whole issue of independence and uh, the complete lack of sovereignty um, that the Scottish independence claim represents but surely the same is the case in in Ireland um, and Pauline you make the point about um, unification is a basic democratic um, demand, but the context in which that happens is um, a, a conglomeration into the EU. And I don't see that there's a, a democratic impulse behind that, unless what you're, you know, there's a tagline or a byline to what you're arguing is that um, independence from the UK and 
uh, national unification of Ireland will lead to Ireland coming out of the EU. If it doesn't, I'm not convinced with the great claim uh, for uh, democracy, or at least more importantly, sovereignty uh, coming out of Irish independence. Brilliant, Sam. So the question there for um, particularly, I suppose, uh, Kevin and, and Pauline, but of course, Brian can chip in. There's no democratic impulse behind the demand for United Ireland if it's part of the EU, says Brexit supporter Simon. Discuss. Love it. Let's move on. We'll, we'll take um, Ella, who I see with the hand up. Ella, if you can hear me, crack on. Thanks, Kevin, and thanks to the speakers. Um, it actually links to what Simon was saying, because I think he's right. Um, he's dead on, because the fact is this, you know, the discussion about, um, in particular, Irish unification is not one, is one that makes me feel queasy um, in terms of the way it's set, because it's um, particularly by the political classes in the south of Ireland. Um, it, this is primarily about um, the relationship with the European Union. Um, there's very little discussion of, you know, for, for various reasons, of the particular nature of um, Ireland's relationship with um, Britain. I mean, uh, it was um, Michael D. Higgins actually wrote a, an article about, um, about the history and not uh, airbrushing out history in the Guardian recently, which was actually a kind of a, fr a refreshing, um, despite it being by Michael T. Higgins, was a refreshing intervention into this kind of uh, bad faith discussion, in particular about Ireland, where where I think people, uh, you know, for for various reasons uh, and various sensitivities, don't want to talk about the particular nature of Ireland's relationship with um, Britain. Nevertheless. I think that just uh, you know, the, despite my nausea about the uh, as a Brexit supporter and voter about um, the kind of sycophantic remaining sycophantic relationship with the European Union among both SNP and Sinn Fein and lots of other parties, um, I I you know think we need to remember that we as Brexit supporters were in this position too. I mean, uh, back in before 2016 when the Brexit vote was called, it certainly wasn't called in circumstances of my particular choosing. Uh, it was, you know, a bit of a Tory infight. Um, the Vote Leave official campaign in the UK was uh, not one that I had much love for. Um, the, the, uh, the outcome of Brexit, those of us who were hopeful thought it might be something more than it's turned out to be, but really a lot of us knew that it was going to be uh, what, it, what, what it is, which is that, uh, you know, yes, we have a very serious change in politics in terms of sovereignty from the European Union, but we still have the problem of um, sovereignty and uh, political control uh, among the public in our own domestic situation. So whether it be issues about the House of Lords, whether it be issues about particular experience we've had throughout the pandemic in the last year and the realization that you know democracy is, a, is something that lots of our own politicians have no sense of what it means. It, it sort of didn't matter what what really was it, it was about was taking that first initial step towards stirring the pot and seeing what might come out in the wash having a bit of an experiment and actually it wasn't in particularly in relation to Brexit it wasn't until the question was asked I mean I didn't have a particularly strong view about the European Union um, and I know lots of people in the UK didn't until the question was asked and at all these different you suddenly realized that it was about a much bigger question than just uh, you know relationship with one institution and I think it's a similar, particularly with Ireland, um, it's a, less so with Scotland for the reasons that Pauline's talked about, but particularly with um, Ireland, there is a, you know, there is this undeniable fact, which is that unless you take that first initial step um, of independence, even if it is independence in the context of joining the European Union, which is, you know, you want to get over and bang people's heads together over there, is, you know, it is that first step. And I think that you know, that no, we don't always make um, decisions and circumstances of our own choosing. And I think that we'd be a little bit perhaps like 
those uh, people on the left in the in England who uh, wouldn't go for Brexit and wouldn't show their support, I mean, Jeremy Corbyn and others, because they didn't like the particular circumstances in which that question was called. And I would hate to be like those people and I would hate to miss a trick. So Ella, thank you. Ella, I'm going to ask you a question and it's, take 20 seconds to answer this. I'm going to abuse my position as chair because I know you and I know your mother and father. Can I ask you what might sound like a naive question? You're a brilliant, skillful political commentator. The fact that you're second generation Irish, has that anything to do? Does that influence or sway your support for Irish independence or not? Well, I can't deny that I have an own particular personal interest in it um, for, for perhaps reasons of the heart. Um, uh, and, you know, reading Trinity over in the pandemic and all that kind of thing. and. Um, it's, it's, I think it's an exciting time, actually, at the moment, because um, questions that you might want to have, uh, have asked or be answered over the last few years is uh, suddenly coming to the fore in ways in which Brexit has stirred up. But also, I mean, you know, personally, one of the things that frustrates me more than anything else is the, in particular in relation to Ireland, um, is the, the, do I want to say cowardice? Possibly the cowardice of many commentators, particularly on the British left, um, of just not wanting to go there with any discussion about um, England's, you know, Britain's relationship with Ireland. Um, so I, I tend to always want to push the boat and and go there. Brilliant. Uh, yeah. Brilliant. I'm, I'm glad. I'm sorry. That was like I had to ask that question. That was brilliant, guys. Pauline and Brian and Kevin, bear with me. I'm going to take two more um, people, which is Carlton Brick and Peter Ramsey. Then it's over to you to come back on the comments and questions of the, the audience. Carlton, can you hear me okay? Hi there, yep, can you hear me? Yep, work away, Carlton. Okay, thanks, thanks, uh, thanks for um, <coughs> uh, answering. Uh, right, okay, um, it's, it's basically, well, I've got a slight problem with the way in which kind of independence is being talked about because it seems that kind of it's being used in the same, sentence in the same phrase as popular sovereignty and particularly I think Pauline's used it a couple of times talking about the independence movement in Scotland as being a, a demand for more control, a demand for uh, popular sovereignty. Um, I, I live, uh, I work up here in Scotland and but I, I don't see that uh, and in fact I think independence or the, the Scottish independence and the way that it's manipulated uh, and the way in which it's used by the SNP and the independence movement more broadly is to counter and exclude the, the popular from, from, from the discussion. Uh, I think kind of what we need to do is rethink what the devolution project was actually about. And there's a kind of myth when it comes to Scotland that the devolved assembly was somehow giving democracy back to the Scottish people. Uh, actually, the devolution, the whole devolution project across Scotland, uh, Wales and Northern Ireland, as far as I can see, was actually uh, an exercise in the British ruling class of outsourcing their legitimacy crisis. So it was not giving democracy back to the people of those regions. It was actually removing it. It was actually taking democracy away. And if you look at the Scottish Assembly, the model is basically it's the EU in Scotland. Uh, the, 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 there's the no sovereignty, there is no debate. It's a technological bureaucratic organisation. So I really, I, I have a problem with this concept that independence equals pop, pop, popular sovereignty, which a number of commentators have used. From my analysis, from my view, and living in Scotland, and living in Scottish politics, it's the opposite. Fair play to you, Carlton, absolutely fair play. Uh, I'm just conscious of the time. I can't believe that we've got less than a, half an hour left. So Peter Ramsey, on to yourself. We'll go back to the speakers. And I see um, Alistair, uh, Alistair Donald has his hand up. So we'll go back out again when the speakers come back and uh, we'll start with Alistair. So Peter Ramsey, are you there? Can you hear yes. me? Yes, can you hear me, Kevin? Peter, loud and clear. Okay, uh, two quick questions. One to Brian, primarily, but my, the others may have something to say, which is, 
do the SNP after Brexit actually want independence? Because independence after Brexit is a very different proposition to independence before Brexit. Uh, and before Brexit, they didn't want their own currency and they didn't want their own head of state. Um, so they still, as I understand it, don't want their own currency. So what does that mean? The euro? The Scottish voters want the euro. So it seems is it more the case, and this arises from uh, Carlton's uh, contribution as well, it seems to me that it does function a bit like the EU, where the SNP can rely on the Tories not giving them the referendum they claim they want. Um, and in that way, they can keep their show on the road when real independence, sovereignty, would be a real problem for them. So that, that's one question. Um, the other is to all, all the speakers, and it concerns whether there's a fundamental difference between um, break, ending the union with Northern Ireland and ending the union between England and Scotland. Um, it seems to me that the most suffocating uh, aspect of contemporary politics, or one of the most suffocating aspects, is identity politics, is the, the, the domination of identity politics uh, and the culture war surrounding that over public life. And it, it's long seemed to me that Northern Ireland is the home of identity politics. It's, as Kevin Mears said to us today, you know, it's built, partition built identity po politics, sectarian identities into the state. And that, that the Good Friday Agreement, const you know, kind of managed the conflict by constitutionalizing uh, that those identity politics and, and Northern Irish politics are completely dominated uh, by these tiresome uh, ancient uh, identity squabbles. So that's kind of built into Northern Ireland. And so the only way out of that is to break the union because it's built into the union. Whereas with Scotland, the opposite seems to be the case that the that devolution and the push for independence can only tend to generate an anti-English, an a Scottish identity that's somehow based on not being English, on taking the rivalry into more than football and rugby, uh, but into a political rivalry. That's the only way. So they kind of seem to me to be opposites. And I just, in that respect, and I wonder what you think about that. Brilliant, Pete. Brilliant. And um, I will tell you the order. Who would like to chip in? Bran, Pauline or Kevin? Would any of you like to come back on Pete and the other people? Can I come in? Oh. Go on, Pauline. Lady, women first, as they used to yeah, say in the right. days of male <laughs> shivering and all the rest of it. Okay. On you go, Pauline. So I'll just take a couple of those. One is um, the, the question that Simon raised, really. I do want to make it plain. I'm actually speaking as a, a British citizen, really. I'm not, I, in, in, you know, I do, I'm being very selfish here, but I see Northern Ireland and the union with Northern Ireland as actually a obstacle to um, democracy in Britain. And, and that's really why I am for reunification. However, I, I, I think Ella's right, and, and, and I think people are right to be uh, cautious about what that actually means. Because um, I also think that um, actually the real obstacle to Irish re reunification is not Britain anymore, really. I think it'd be great if British people got behind it because it would be something positive to do rather than just let the whole thing, you know, just decay and fall apart. But I think that actually the real obstacle to Irish reunification is, um, is, is those that hold power in Ireland. I think it's a threat to those who hold power in Ireland. And I have to say, uh, Kevin, on your great new website, Kevin Rooney there, um, Ray Bassett's um, article, which I'd really recommend people read, uh, made the point that actually people, the, the, um, the parties, the political parties in Ireland, uh, don't want a reunification and um, it's it, it actually represents a, a threat to them and he also makes a very interesting point which is the the, 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 the Good Friday Agreement actually in a sense is a recognition that that uh, Northern Ireland has seceded from Ireland and that that's legitimate and that it has a um, its own autonomy it's an entity that has um a, a, that it decides its own future by um this its own little small internal democracy so i think it's a very interesting thing and i don't i agree with ella that irish unification is um you know full of contradictions and it's very different from what it was say um in in the past it's not a claim for a self-determining 32 county republic i agree 
the the other thing is that um, yeah, I would agree as well with Carlton to an extent, and I I didn't mean to say that um, I thought that the call for Scottish independence was a um, a, a democratic or a, a demand for sovereignty, sorry, popular sovereignty. But I did say I think that we that I think that we um, that is people who are Democrats should actually pay attention to what people are asking for. I think I think what I think it's that often these calls express a yearning for something, and um, and I, I don't think they're dis to be dismissed. I also think that Scottish independence has many different currents within it. It's very contradictory, and the SMP is only one. And probably not the, you know, the most independence-focused um, element of um, Scottish independence. It is, I think. I think the characterisation of it as a sort of EU in Scotland is, is brilliant. Whoever came up with Pauline, that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have yeah, to stop yeah, yeah. you there, Pauline. Yeah, I, I can't believe the time it just flew on. Yeah. Um, uh, Brad or Kevin, on you go. Just one of you start speaking. Okay, uh, as I was asked a particular question, I'll jump in. Um, does the SNP want independence? Um, uh, well, I'd say that, I'd define it as, does the, the, the ruling elite of the SNP want independence? Uh, and I'd actually, the reason I, I say that is because actually I think uh, Nicholas Sturgeon uh, has done one thing, and that is not just so much divide Scotland uh, as divide her own party. I think uh, the SNP is riven uh, with contradictions and dissent, uh, and that generally they have not been exposed because of the quest for independence uh, that has overcome it. And, that, uh, and let me describe that. That means, you know, let's be quiet and get independence first. And so let's not reveal uh, what we are doing to each other or how much we disagree uh, or some of our own scandals, uh, which are well known. Um, so, so. Uh, we, we have a situation where, where to me anyway, I'm convinced that, that, that what people like Nicola Sturgeon and her, her, her uh, cabal essentially want is to retain power at all costs uh, rather than uh, do the effective job of convincing people that independence or secession or separatism could work. Um, I think that's quite different from what uh, Alex Salmond sought to do. Alex Salmond, I think, tried to uh, not really rock the boat a great deal, but actually take Scotland down a road where it could, he could say, look, we've done pretty well. Uh, we're not, we're not, you know, uh, child murderers. We don't drink blood. We're not satanic. Uh, the SNP have done a decent job. Let's, let's have more powers. Let's go on to eventually to have independence. That was the approach that Alex took. Um, and uh, I think it was paying off. Uh, but having failed to win in 2014, what we have now is a, is a, a an SNP that is actually under its own policy in favour of a new currency, but from the SNP's leadership uh, is not working for one. It's not seeking to actually make Scotland an enviable, pla enviable place that could say we can go it alone. In fact, many of the measurements of outcomes are worse now than when devolution started. Uh, and they've got worse, not since the beginning, but since they took power. Um, and, so, and so what we've seen is a devolution that has actually centralised power. Scotland is now the most centralised part of the UK, as the SNP has sought to bring more powers under their own control and, and, and uh, taken powers away from local authorities and, and, and various agencies. Uh, we only have one police force, for instance, uh, one uh, fire service and so on and so forth. Um, so I think there is an anti-democratic nature uh, in the SNP and its government, which actually I think works against uh, its own cause. Uh, certainly if I was seeking to plan as a strategy how to win uh, the, the independence of Scotland, I would go about it a completely different way and, and seek to win people's uh, uh, hearts, but also their minds to show how the deficit could be uh, solved and, and how actually the pensions could be paid after independence and so on and so forth, to give people that relaxed reassurance that they would not be making the leap off the cliff. Um, so I think, I think the, the democratic uh, deficit that people have talked about, a uh, number of people there, um, is, is a real problem for the SNP and, and, and just simply going into the EU uh, I think would, would become very difficult. And that's, of course, why they are not offering a referendum of Scotland going into the EU were it independent. 
Brian, that's brilliant. Look, um, Kevin, just before I take you, can I say to the audience, uh, I can't believe time has really flown through. So if you do want to speak, make it a very quick point, but please do come in with a couple of quick points. I'm really keen to see if there's one or two people out there after Alistair who want to support Scottish independence uh, and say something because quite a few people are having a pop at it, which is absolutely brilliant as well. I just want to hear all, all sides and positions. Uh, Kevin, on to you. European Union, being a member of that is effectively anti-sovereignty. How can you have self-determination when you're going into the EU, which effectively is unaccountable and uh, overrides national self-determination? On you go, Kevin. I, I think that's a marginal argument in Ireland, I have to say. I think it's a marginal argument in Scotland. I think they both recognise that the EU uh, looks and feels and acts in the interests of small countries. Ireland especially now thinks that um, given Irish diplomacy has outwitted um, this Conservative government and uh, the best brains in Whitehall, uh, they, they, they didn't uh, take little old Ireland seriously. They thought that uh, flogging, the Germans flogging BMWs to people in the southeast of England would outweigh um, the, the, so, the, 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 the shared sovereignty and, and, and the kind of esprit de corps uh, of, of a small member state. And Britain was wrong. Um, and and we've, we've seen the results of that. It's not a great result for exit for anybody. There's lots of issues, lots of problems to work out and all the rest of it. Um, but I think Ireland and Scotland look to the EU as a way not of undermining their sovereignty, but actually um, giving them a seat at a table where they are treated as equals. Granted that, you know, the qualified majority voting and all the rest of it and the Franco-German alliance and all the rest of it. But they see that, I think, as a preferable option to be in a peripheral part of the United Kingdom. I think that was what I would say on that. Just very quickly on Scotland. I mean, I, I don't have a dog in the fight in, in many respects. I'm not yeah. Scottish. Um, I, I follow Scottish politics, lots of Scottish friends and, and take a keen interest in it. But it just strikes me. And I've made this observation many times and got in trouble with um, people in the Scottish Labour Party complained um, about my views. The Labour Party in Scotland has been a disaster for the last 20 years. The, the Scottish Tories are a disaster. They've had a brief um, fillip with, with Ruth Davidson, who's a pretty compelling figure. But the, Scot the, you know, the Scottish Tories are on, on the last legs and Scottish Labour's on its last legs. I, I don't foresee um, a, a kind of renaissance in, in the, the once impenetrable fortress Scottish Labour Party anytime soon. I, I think it's been a disaster. I think as the Labour Party has taken the place for granted as, it, as its backyard and it's paid the price for doing that. I, I mean, I tried to sort of say before that it, really this is a, you know, a, a slow motion collision. The SNP have not just sprung up out of nowhere in the last two or three years. This has been at least 20 years of, of, of attrition. Um, and, and at various times, Westminster, the Scottish, Scottish um, Labour and Conservative parties have had chances to get the house in order and they, they just haven't. And I think we've, we've arrived at that point now where, where the SNP is, is a very formidable um, opponent um, for, for, the, for the mainstream parties. It is a chimera. It is, it, you know, it's, it's banding together. I think somebody mentioned that you know, that, you know, that, that um, it, there's a lot of contradictions there. And I think it's, a, you know, it, like the old phrase about new Labour, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a coalition that's a mile wide and an inch thick. Um, but, but I think it is a chimera. It manages to pull together the kind of, you know, loosely the, the William Wallace faction all the way through to the achingly woke. Uh, I, mean, I mean, you know, there are some people in the SNP who are, you know, incredibly, incredibly right on. And it, 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 it's, it's not what you expect in a sense from a, from a, from a nationalist party. Um, so, so the SNP is hard to hit, which is why I think we've seen this, this attempted um, hit job on, on Nicola Sturgeon, uh, which, which, which has, seems to have completely failed this week. And of course, week is a long time in politics, as uh, Mr. Wilson pointed out. And, and I would fully expect to see um, polls and independents um, re reverting to the recent paradigm where I think it was 21 in a row that showed support for independence at over 50%. Um, is it too late? I suspect not. There's lots of contradictions with Scotland and lots of contradictions in the argument. Uh, somebody alluded a minute ago to the issue about the currency and, and head of state and all the rest of it. And, and, and really what, what surprises me looking at this as, as slightly from a distance is that with all of those contradictions, 45% of Scots voted to leave the UK as recently as six and a half years ago. And I don't see anything that's changed fundamentally in, in that calculation since. I, I suspect, uh, you know, as I, as I say, it's exhilarating to be at the birth of a nation, whether you're a Brexiteer 
whether you're a Scottish nationalist or whether you're a United Islander, some, some of the sort of smaller pocketbook issues just do not compute. You, you want to, you, you know, you're a big picture person. So, so I don't know what the big picture argument is for the union and retaining the union with Scotland. I'm all ears if anybody's got any suggestions. And I'd like to see the, the, the Labour Party in Scotland recover, much as I'm deeply critical of it, because we're never going to get a Labour government until that happens. Northern Ireland is entirely different. Northern Ireland has been an unmitigated disaster for 100 years. Um, there, is, there, is, there is no good argument for retaining Northern Ireland. And I don't hear anybody from first principles ever making one. Um, I don't, I, and, and that, I, I would, that would, I would say that even, even of unionists as well. And there are many of those that are that are very alive to the growing um, debate around Irish unity and willing to contribute to it. And I think this is a genuine moment where people do do want to hear all those contributions. And there is a lot on the table. There was there was a two-hour program, uh, prime time program on RTE um, at the start of the week with with all sorts of voices um, from the unionist tradition as well. Um, talking about um, Irish unity and how that would happen. Every, every, everybody was in, you know, involved, Michal Martin, Leo Varadkar, Mary Lee MacDonald, lots of people from, from civic organisations as well. Uh, and Jim O'Callaghan, who is a, is a senior Fianna Fáil politician and likely to be the next leader of his party, was speaking at Cambridge University as recently as last night, um, spelling out um, some of his views as well. So that, that debate is, is much more advanced. It is much more rational. Um, and we have a mechanism already established in the Good Friday Agreement to have a border poll and to resolve this issue with everybody's consent once and for all. That's slightly different than what we've got with Scotland, clearly. So I think Northern Ireland is in a very different place. And in a sense, as I say, Westminster has, has, you know, has never had much affection, much affinity, and I think has already priced in that Northern Ireland will go in the next few years. Scotland's a different matter, but as I say, I don't know how the Scottish independence um, um, issue can be put back in a box. Brilliant, Kevin. Uh, for our English listeners and our Scottish listeners, or almost everybody listening, uh, if you if you don't live in the <coughs> south of Ireland, the programme that Kevin was referring to, the Clare Burn Show, guys, you, you couldn't exaggerate the grip of that programme on the nation. It seemed like everybody in Ireland was watching that programme. Anybody who's anybody appeared on it, and it really moved the debate about United Ireland to the absolute centre of Irish politics and society um, two nights ago. So uh, I'm glad that you mentioned that, Kevin, to give our listeners a sense of, of what was going on two nights ago. Right. What's going to happen is I see Alistair Donald and I see Dennis and Bernie on the hands. And what I'm going to do is this is the last time I'm going to go out because of the time situation. And I'm looking, and yes, it's Alistair Donald, and Dennis and Bernie has changed to Dennis. So we're going to take those two, and can I say to Bran and Pauline and Kevin, can you be thinking about what you want to leave us with? What's your final thoughts? Imagine you're speaking to the in-betweeners, and for our audience, if you don't know who the in-betweeners are, this is the term that's been born, especially in the north of Ireland, with those people who are neither unionist or Irish nationalist, United Ireland is just sort of undecided. And they're, they're, they're the demographic that's going to swing the, the, the referendum vote one way or the other when it comes. And it's the same with Scotland in a way, I think, as well. So what, what, what would you say finally to convince them? And of course, any final immediate thoughts on the union that you might have? But without further ado, second last speaker of the night, Alistair, it's over to you. Well, the first thing I say is I can see Siobhan waving her hand, wanting to speak as well. So maybe oh, I cannot see her. So thank you for that. There as well, just so she doesn't uh, get left out. But I, I guess th this is these these are difficult discussions, and I think they're difficult um, primarily for two reasons. The first is that the big political decisions of recent times have been taken in an absence of political leadership which I think is really important. So if you think about Brexit, it happened basically because of a groundswell of popular opinion, which uh, grew from 2010 onwards, um, eventually manifested itself in the, in, in the referendum result. Um, but really without any of the political parties standing up and taking responsibility for arguing Brexit, and it was only in the aftermath of Brexit where the Tories were forced to adapt uh, to the popular position, that uh, things were eventually forced through in the end. So the people forced the political leadership to adopt to a position, but they've never ever taken political responsibility for Brexit. 
And so the, uh, the coming out of the EU has coincided not with a clear set of ideas for what the future of the UK might be like, but with uh, politicians kind of scrambling around trying to uh, justify uh, what you know, coming out and 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 adapting to that that popular opinion. So that's that's the first thing. I think I think that we the the discussion takes place in the absence of a clear political vision for the future, and that manifests itself, I think, in the second problem, which is that a lot of the. Uh, categories that we use just now in these types of discussions from nationalism and unionism and democracy and all the rest of it, they've all largely been emptied of the political content or the meaning that they used to have in the past. So if you think about the uh, discussion of, the, of, of, of nationalism, for example, in Scotland, we have Scottish nationalists arguing for independence, but they're not nationalists in any sort of coherent or clear uh, historic sense, sense of the word. Um, in fact, they're anti-nationalists. I mean, they spend all their time these days worrying over the, the consequences of nationalism. In fact, for the last four or five years, they've defined themselves against Brexit and the perceived dangers of nationalism. Likewise, unionists in Scotland are a really strange bunch just now because they don't really argue for the union. In fact, a lot of them now make their argument against nationalism. They're the anti-nationalists. If you look at a lot of the, the, the new, um, the people that stand outside of the traditional unionists within the Tories and, 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 and what have you, they define themselves as anti-nationalists, which makes no sense really for, for um, uh, it, it lacks a meaning. And likewise, democracy as well. I mean, Scottish democracy, uh, to the extent that it is democracy, democracy in, in the Scottish Parliament is a set of procedures rather than a product of popular discussion and ideas and democratic debate. So it does seem to me that the starting point for trying to sort this all out is uh, almost to try and reconceive some of the political ideals and ideas that we need to grapple with for, for the future. I mean, personally, I think the two to start with would be democracy and what that means and what that means in the United Kingdom. And secondly, and most important, probably most importantly, freedom, uh, uh, because uh, any nation comes with the promise of greater freedom for its people. And that seems to me to be exactly what is not on offer just now anywhere, either in the UK or Scotland. So starting to prioritize our thinking around freedom and, and democracy, which essentially is an assertion of taking responsibility for our future, which I think, uh, as has uh, rightly been said, Scottish, the Scottish National Party is about avoiding responsibility for our future and the Tories in the UK uh, uh, likewise. That assertion of taking responsibility around freedom and democracy would be a starting point for a conversation. Thanks, Alistair. Um, guys, um, because I haven't interrupted and I've let people speak, um, we're in a bit of crisis with time. We're supposed to finish at half eight and get six minutes so we're going to struggle, but bear with us if we go a wee bit over time. Dennis, we're going to take yourself and Siobhan. I can't see a hand anywhere, but I'm hoping that you're out there because people are messaging me saying Siobhan's waving her hand and I can't see it. And it was the same with Pete Ramsey earlier. So apologies, Pete Ramsey, if I didn't take it earlier. I, I didn't see a hand at this end. Dennis, are you there? Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Clears the bell, Dennis. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks for organising this, Kevin, and congratulations on the website. Um, I watched the Claire Byrne programme, I was very struck by it. Um, I thought one of the most interesting aspects of, you know, that depicts Irish society at the moment was when that character, Joe... Um, Brawley, Joe Brawley. Yeah, when, when he intervened and um, pointed out that there was still a kind of, you know, a level of derision for the whole notion of Irish society uh, amongst unionists and sort of got swept to one side and in a fairly undemocratic manner got shut up, basically. It tells you something about the Southern Irish elites, if you like, uh, the Southern Irish politicians and the way they feel their society should be run. Uh, not least, uh, you know, they don't have to take any lessons in, uh, in, uh, in um, anti-democratic politics from the EU. They have plenty of their own. But um, I, I think, you know, Mary, Mary Lou MacDonald was the most interesting of them uh, because Sinn Féin is a party that contests elections north and south. 
and is involved in politics north and south. And they have an idea that the young people of Ireland uh, uh, who are very pro-EU, but also, um, you know, sort of full of, as Pete, Pete Ramsey pointed out, identity politics, not the old identity politics of the sectarian divide, but the new identity politics that is supposed to be characterized by the EU, you know, the notion of cosmopolitan, internationalist, uh, you know, above all this old style party politics and seeking to kind of maneuver into that position to make the basis for a united Ireland. Uh, and, you know, in all honesty, that's the most credible argument that I hear in relation to a, uh, being able to sort of, you know, build something new in Ireland, uh, much as I uh, am suspicious of Sh Sinn Féin and always have been. But um, uh, I think, um, you know, the possibility of Irish sovereignty, which would be the keystone as Pete Ramsey sees it as the keystone for British society for its future, then Irish sovereignty must also be the keystone for, for our future in Ireland, if we're to have one, where the democratic participation of people in society will be the necessity, will, will, will be the absolute necessity for any kind of decent future for us. But, um, you know, as John Bruton pointed out, there's going to be the necessity for the democratic uh, politicians to deal with the fact that we have a small minority of maybe it may be if we get a, a proper result in the uh, in the border poll who you know will basically have to either leave or be coerced and you know people have to deal with the actual realities of what's going to go on if this border poll is successful yes yes uh, very very interesting last point I i've been thinking about that myself dennis I'm not going to prolong the discussion tonight, but I'm really glad you, you touched on that. I've been mulling it over in my own mind and I can't quite work through how I'm going to deal with it myself. But yeah, um, I think we've got Siobhan. Are you there, Siobhan? Yeah, I am. Sorry, Kevin, that you couldn't see me. You're obviously on a different page than me. Sorry about that. Oh, well, greetings um, from London to Dublin. <laughs> it's nice to and th have thanks, to, thanks to all those people who then tried to intervene on my behalf. I'm sure now that now I feel really embarrassed because I was never going to say anything all that exciting or interesting anyway. But uh, there you go. <laughs> I suppose I'd like to congrat. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm tuned in from Dublin. Uh, so partly heart, the heart to some extent of this debate, but I congratulate Kevin on setting up the website and then Liverpool Salon on hosting tonight's debate because I think it is very important that the democratic deficit around a united Ireland and around Britain's role in Ireland is addressed within Britain. So I'm very in favour of British people having an argument and a debate and supporting the call for Irish unity in a very active way. And because this is about Britain in Ireland, it is not about sectarian headcounts in Northern Ireland. And it never was about that. And I suppose one of the most dispiriting things being um, in favour of uh, being a Republican in the Republic of Ireland, so-called Republic of Ireland, is that nobody else agrees with you, including Sinn Féin. Um, and so even though I found the programme on Monday interesting, I wasn't, I was, you know, I think the most interesting thing about it is that it really shows you how things can happen really quickly. And that even though, yes, um, the whole issue around Ireland has been full of British inertia, Irish inertia, trying to ignore it, wishing it would go away and fall off. I think it's really interesting that within a year now, mainstream Irish television, every mainstream politician is having to talk about what's going to happen when Ireland unites. And so I think it's a very, very interesting thing that something can happen so fast. But I wouldn't take it for granted. I think we do. I think Pauline's right. The argument does need to be made in Britain for British people who will not have a vote, which is part of the anti-democratic nature of this whole debate. The vote will be in the North and in the South separately. British people will have no vote. So the whole thing is incredibly anti-democratic anyway. So I agree with Alistair that even when you talk about that's supposed to be democracy for Ireland, but in actual fact, the whole Good Friday Agreement was completely anti-democratic anyway, even though it's now held up across the world as being the best thing since sliced bread. So I, I really encourage British people to get behind. You're going to be left out of this debate because nobody really cares what British people think about this. 
But I would really welcome the fact that British people should talk about it, should get involved. From my point of view, they should support the um, push for a united Ireland, but also they should push for it because of the fact that hopefully it would mean a new Ireland would be created and that may open up avenues for new a new Britain to be created as well. Once you get rid of the terrible baggage that Britain holds around what it has done in Ireland, hopefully that's a step in the right direction for actually for Britain, whether that's the United Kingdom or Britain, maybe hopefully, as Pauline said earlier, it'll be a better place as well because it'll have got rid of us. Pauline, thank, or, uh, Siobhan, thank you. That reminded me of the original song contest there for some reason when you were saying greetings from Dublin. <laughs> Here's the score from the Irish panel. Um, anyway, sorry guys if that didn't... No point. That was... <laughs> Brilliant. Um, guys, we're now coming to the roundup marks. Give us... Um, you know, one to two minutes of your final thoughts. Uh, it's almost impossible to ask the panel to do that because I'm actually hypersensitive to the fact that this conversation can be convoluted potentially because you're trying to look at the union, which is one question. You're trying to look at Scotland and North of Ireland, which is like in a way separate questions and you're trying to bring them together. So try your best, Pauline and Kevin and Brian to leave us with um, food for thought. Um, I think we'll go, um, why don't we, who would like to speak? There you are, Brian, your, your face has magically appeared in front of me, so why don't you give us your final thoughts? Well, we've not got a great deal of time, so I'll really just cut to the chase, and I think that the uh, what I'll say is that I actually think uh, the United Kingdom will survive, and I think it, it will survive in its current form, uh, including Nor Northern Ireland in that. Uh, I, I believe that because uh, I actually think blood is thicker than water. It's not just about the economics. Um, to keep on your musical theme, I'd borrow from Sister Sledge and say we are family. And I say that because I actually think in this COVID pandemic, uh, there have been many examples when we've seen that, in fact, uh, British solidarity uh, has been uh, strengthened uh, and faith in it uh, can grow. I think in good times, uh, it's very easy to be relaxed and take things for granted. But in hard times, uh, some of the uh, attributes of being British uh, shine through. And, uh, and I'm not saying that in an exceptional way. I think many other countries find the same themselves. But I think in this uh, more difficult, challenging time, uh, I think we've seen some real examples of the solidarity of people caring for each other. And I say that also with British people caring about what's been happening uh, in, in the Republic of Ireland too. So I, I, I don't really see a great impetus for change, much as the politics, the polling might suggest that. Uh, I, I think that the head, uh, together with the, 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 the heart, uh, will actually uh, prevail and that uh, Britain won't crack up uh, to answer your question. Brian, thank, thanks a million. And uh, can I say, I know we've still got two speakers, but I want to just thank you in particular because you're, you're a Scottish Unionist and uh, you're very aware that I'm a United Irelander and of the panel. And, uh, you know, you might have thought I'm not going to go to this debate because it's a bit of a setup, but I think you've been brilliant. I don't agree with some of the stuff, but I think you've been brilliant and you've really added to the quality of the discussion. And thinking about you, Bram, with this website, um, irishborderpool.com, that we've just set up, you're exactly the sort of person we'd love to get on to it and interview and debate and have articles from and continue the discussion. So thanks very much, Bram. I'll be looking at it. Brilliant. And um, uh, Pauline, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I'd like to say, um, I, I think just to start with Brian's point, I, I'm totally with him. I feel a great um, attachment people I know lots of people and I have a huge attachment to people I know and people I don't know in Scotland, Ireland, Wales and England and I think that um, what makes me very unhappy is that these resentments and these, um, these divisions should exist and should drive people apart and I think that the that there are I do link it to the democratic deficit I think that where people have um, have control over their lives and where they are engaged in working on really big political, economic, social uh, projects, then um, these sort of things fall away. This is a symptom 
these petty resentments and and this sort of you know the identity politics that uh, Peter was talking about are a symptom of um, of a decline in um, in in a decay of of political life in Britain, Scotland, in Ireland. So it does make me very unhappy um, to see these resentments, and um, and I do feel very much part of a family. Um, I'm like Brian. I, I feel very much at home in Britain and in Ireland. I would say, however, my principle is this: that the authority. Um, that our authority over um, over our governments, you know, derives really from the government's relationship with its own people and on its own territory. I I I, I don't think that we can we it isn't democratic to impose um, um, authority from outside of a of a of a national political community, and that's why I think that um, Northern Ireland is a sort of vestige. Of a of a, a bad an old imperial past, which is a, an anachronism today in 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 modern Britain. So I think that um, it has to go because um, it it just doesn't um, it just doesn't work. It's anachronistic, and I think it'll be a great thing. And um, I don't think it'll be an easy thing, though. For all the things people have said, I think democratic renewal is not going to be easy either in Britain or in Ireland, but maybe if we, as Siobhan said, I think can uh, support one another and, and engage with each other and have some sympathy and listen to each other, um, and including listening to, to people we don't agree with, but just to engage with that, I think we'll find that we will, it will be easier to do and that we can do it from the bottom up rather than having uh, solutions continually imposed upon us. Pauline, thank you very much. And Kevin, the union is it cracking up? Independent Scotland, uh, yes or no? United Ireland. I think you'd not be surprised yes no. to learn. Uh, yes, I think it's certainly in part. Um, I, I, I was just struck by Alistair's point about um, the lack of political leadership led to um, Brexit, um, and it got me thinking. Yeah, no, I, what we what we faced, I think, in British politics for quite some time is. A crisis of popular legitimacy, popular leadership. We've got different centres of power. We've got uh, Westminster, the Westminster parties. You know, all three of them, Labour, Conservative, and Liberal Democrat, in in all of them, in, in their own way, in pretty bad shape. We've got some incredibly duff MPs. Uh, we've got we've got some very very good people um, in the nations and regions. Whether that's an Andy Burnham in Greater Manchester or whether that's or whether that's a whole phalanx of politicians in the SNP. The SNP turn out their, their 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 best 11 every game and I think I think I think you know as I say Scottish Labour and the Scottish Tories have just not been equal to the task of taking the SNP on for very many years and what the SNP have been incredibly good at is framing the whole political discussion um, in, in, in Scotland and covering up, somebody alluded a, a, a while ago to some of the failures of the, of the Scottish government. Yes, quite rightly, um, but it's made absolutely zero impact either with the polls or with real votes. Um, and obviously Nicola Sturgeon's um, perceived handling of, of, of coronavirus is, is, is in marked contrast um, to Boris Johnson's. So, so I, don't, I don't see how, um, in the next six weeks, this situation changes dramatically, and I would expect the SNP. Um, I don't think we'll get a, an overall majority. I think we'll, I think I think the other parties will just prevent that from happening, and I think the the uncertainty carries on uh, on, on in, in Scotland, uh, Northern Ireland. I think, as as I say, is in a different place. I think uh, as a concept, Northern Ireland is on its last legs. It wasn't meant to last this long. Um, it's going to lose 600 million euro of funding from the European Union as of next year. Um, that's that's a lot of um, that's a lot of um, Protestant farmers um, who are thinking. Wait a minute. When I was in the EU, I got guaranteed payments. Now I'm at the I'm at the end of a very long laundry list of demands from a British Chancellor of the Exchequer. Um, would I get a better deal um, if we if I was to um, seed the sovereignty question and save the family farm by, by looking at the, the attractions of the United Ireland automatic re-entry into the European Union. There are people having those conversations. I wouldn't over, I don't over emphasize and I don't over egg it, but those, com those kinds of rational conversations are being, are being had. Um, Northern Ireland is of course different because we have a mechanism in place for a transfer of sovereignty embedded in the Good Friday Agreement. The Good Friday Agreement is many things, um, but it is 
ultimately a blueprint for the peaceful reunification of the island of Ireland, um, and and that is its central purpose. Um, there is no argument um, that I've heard that compel that I find even remotely compelling for the continuation of the status quo in regards to Northern Ireland's existence. I think it's a different case, a different question. Um, in terms of Scotland, but as, as I say, I don't know who makes that case in Scotland because the Scottish Tory party is in no state to make it, neither is the Scottish Labour Party, and we'll soon see in a few weeks' time whether we go from, um, you know, from, from a, a mild crisis to a very real constitutional crisis in six weeks' time. Kevin, um, thank you very, very much, and um, thank you very much for everything you've done for IrishBorderPool.com as we set up. Um, your, 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 your Twitter um, help has been fantastic in putting the word around. But Kevin, thanks for your thoughts tonight. Absolutely brilliant. And Brian and Pauline, tricky subject. Um, we we're always only going to scrape the surface, but we've done that. And to you, the audience, guys, thanks for, for, for tuning in and um, chipping in with your contributions and listening. Um, we have a lot to learn. We have a lot to sharpen up on, I think. I, sp I speak for myself at irishborderpool.com on our website. I'd love you to go and check it out, and, but also leave your name and uh, email on the sign-up. That would be great. We're going to do a lot more events. We're going to invite lots of people to write for us. We don't want to be in a silo. We don't want to be shouting angrily at the opposition. We want to in invite the, op the opposition. We want to invite people who disagree with us to write and speak for our irishborderpool.com so please come and join us and finally can I thank Pauline and Stephanie um, from the Liverpool Salon for giving um, Irish Border Pool the new wee baby on the scene uh, a chance to team up with them to have this debate um, I very much appreciate it and Stephanie do I need to hand over to you for any last words Stephanie before I say goodbye to everyone um, only to say thank you so much for being a brilliant chair this evening as well and thanks to the speakers and to all those who made contributions, it's been fascinating. Um, and just to also say to follow us if you can on Twitter and Facebook, um, because there you'll you'll get updates on forthcoming events. Um, and yeah, that's about it. So thanks again. Thanks, Stephanie. Uh, and thanks everybody and good night. And uh, you've earned your glass of wine tonight. So go away, have a nice wee glass of wine. Break your length and pledge if you're off for Lent. And, uh, all the best, guys, and uh, hopefully we'll speak and see each other soon. So good night, guys. Good night. Lovely to meet you. Bye-bye, bye -bye, guys. Bye. Thanks, Kevin. Night, all. Good night, Anna. That's it. Bye-bye, Stella. -bye, I'm going to head off, but... Just to say bye bye. Bye. Nice to meet you, Brian. It's lovely. Yeah, thank you so much. Great. I'm going to go. It's pretty we can't go and get a drink now, but we can we have to go off to the, yeah. I'm going to the bridge now, not to the bar. I really need a glass of wine. Yeah. Yeah. Great. It's yeah. lovely to meet you, Brian. I hope we meet again. My glass <laughs> oh, brilliant. What's that? Is it whiskey? No. Water. Tonic. Oh, <laughs> Without the gin. <laughs> okay. Take Lovely care. Lovely meeting you. Lovely to meet you. See you later. Bye. Bye now. Bye. Bye. Steph, I'll see you.